this roundtable discussion uh, from the Municipal uh, Affairs, Tourism, Housing, and Guam Preservation Trust is called to order. It's uh, about 9.04, 6 in the morning. Um, I want to extend my undunkle and to Masi for all participating in this roundtable, uh, this morning's roundtable discussion. <clears throat> Oftentimes, these roundtables uh, bring us together to uh, solve a problem, and while the reason for today's meetings raised some eyebrows and garnered some unfavorable headlines for our tourism industry, I think uh, that we have a very, very real opportunity to more than just fix uh, this problem. Uh, our primary objective is to protect our visitors, um, promote small business, and create a level playing field. I, I hope to achieve these goals throughout uh, our work. Uh, moreover, <clears throat> we need to send a clear message that we will not tolerate any activities that might harm our visitors or the viability of our visitor industry. Uh, each time an unlicensed operator uh, makes direct contact with our visitors, that operator places our in entire industry at risk. He doesn't pay for taxes, they don't follow our industry standards, and he operates in the shadow, potentially hurting our community. And simply put, an unlicensed business is an illegal business. One, we can't monitor, regulate, or efficiently assist during emergencies. I want to be clear, any policy we craft, we will keep those doing B&Bs the right way in business. If you have a room and you want to make a little money on the side by sharing your home with a couple of visitors, nothing should change for you. However, as we have so painfully seen in the media, if you own a four-bedroom house and rent it to 20 customers, that is clearly not what the law is intended. Today, I hope that the views and comments you share with us will include three basic topics. One, what are the perspectives on policy changes that will strengthen our existing B&B &B law? How can we further ensure that its original intent is safely and effectively accomplished? Two, what actions can we take immediately to capture the tax dollars garnered from sites like Airbnb and others? Should we explore partnerships with these sites which will access and collect local taxes on our behalf, something that is being done successfully in other states. Three, how can we establish an efficient and sustainable enforcement policies? What opportunities are available to help generate revenue in a safe and genuine and visitor-friendly manner? <coughs> For the record, uh, I will note that any change um, I propose to our existing law will be vetted by the people at this table first. That said, I know that we all want to make this work for Guam. That is where we start today, and I'm sure that is where we will be when our discussions are done. Any questions that can be addressed at this meeting will be addressed once everyone's been given a chance to speak. And in addition, the uh, floor will be open to our government representatives. Um, I'd like uh, to thank my colleagues who are here this morning. Uh, I have with me, uh, Senator, uh, my Vice Chair, uh, Vice Speaker B.J. Cruz, uh, Senator Tom Atta, Senator Mary Torres, Senator Frank Bloss. Did I mention everybody? Thank you. And um, so, uh, So before we get to the basics of our existing law, I'd like to go over some basic rules, okay? Uh, I ask that we all agree that today's discussion is purely, purely for informational purposes. One, where all those who wish to share their views be allowed to do so. Uh, my staff is here and they will be taking detailed notes and ensuring that every question is documented so that we may answer them either here or in future meetings. Uh, I understand that uh, we're all very passionate about this issue, but in the spirit of having a focused, action-oriented, and productive conversation, 
I, I ask that all comments be addressed to the chair and please be respectful of all the members in this panel. All questions or inquiries should be addressed to the chair first who will call upon the appropriate member of the panel to provide an answer. If an answer cannot be given at this roundtable discussion, a written answer will be sought and provided to all those in attendance. For informational purposes, all comments and questions will be noted for the record. Uh, I, I do have the law that exists today, Public Law 32-45, and I know that uh, if you don't have a copy, my staff will be able to provide one for you. And there are six se sections that effectively establish a bed and breakfast operation as a legal business in the Guam Code annotated and defines it as a private residence or building appurtenant or accessory to a private residence containing five or fewer rooms intended or designed to be used or which are used, rented or hired out, to be occupied or which occupied for sleeping purposes. No home may be licensed as a bed and breakfast whose physical address is the physical address of a registered sex offender. Uh, it provides zoning authority for operation in residential neighborhood areas. Three, it provides zoning authority in R2 or multiple dwelling zones. Uh, four, it includes bed and breakfast type operation. Five, imposition, sex sets maximum night stays less than 90 days. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with this in mind, I'd like to turn the floor over to first. I do know GVB's here. And uh, Vice Speaker, do you have any comments? Okay. Uh, GVB and then Department of Revenue and Tax. I'd like to thank also the other government representatives that are invited. And I hear I see uh, GPD and Public Health. Thank you very much for being here. So at this time, uh, GVB and then Rev Tax. Amen. Good morning, Madam Chairman. And everyone here. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, the GVB board has uh, looked at this issue, and we've kind of we have a unanimous sort of perspective, and that is um, that. No matter what happens for bed and breakfast or vacation rentals, all operations should be fully licensed, pay uh, their full tax, be safe, be inspected as needed. Um, and we felt that an equally important component is enforcement. So whatever we come up with today, uh, it's uh, clearly important that we have a, a mechanism to realistically enforce it. Um, we were uh, very cognizant and respectful of the issue of protecting neighborhoods and making sure that residential communities don't become <coughs> sort of uh, places where you're not comfortable for the safety of your children. Having said all of that, at the same time, we really support the notion of opportunities for locals to participate in the hospitality industry, for tourists to get into our communities and to see the hospitality of the, the local people. And of course, uh, five or six months out of the year, there's a shortage of rooms. So it's, it's not an easy thing, I think, to balance the, the needs of the local community, um, protect the neighborhoods, and at the same time offer those opportunities. I think unanimously we really want to focus on making sure the taxes are paid, they're properly regulated, and they're licensed. And then on the issue of finding that balance between the local community needs and uh, trying to satisfy those other issues, I'll leave it to the policymakers to, to figure out that challenge. But we're, we're excited to be here, and we really appreciate your support of the, the issue. Thank you, Mr. Moldega. Uh, I did forget, ladies and gentlemen, if you speak into the mic, just please state your name, where you're from, and just so that our staff can be able to get all the information right with the names. Okay, thank you. Nate. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, uh, Chairman Baudiga covered most of uh, what I was wanting to say as well. Uh, I just wanted to point out, uh, we've been doing a lot of research uh, looking at other uh, case studies, Hawaii, and a lot of destinations are dealing with this exact um, issue. So there's a lot of good information on, on the web. So if I look a little tired, I was up doing some research. But I, I think in our bill uh, that we that you passed, uh, uh, Senator, the uh, it doesn't define the difference between B and B and what's called a vacation rental. So B and B is someone living there, renting out the room. Uh, vacation rental, uh, and this is the, this is what Hawaii did: is vacation rentals. You, you don't rent it. You, you don't live there, but you're renting it out. Uh, so they define that difference, and they treat them a little bit differently through their, uh, through their through their laws. Um, so that's something that we may be looking at as an opportunity. Uh, they're they're also talking about Airbnb. Um, uh, you know, Airbnb a great opportunity for for residents to really connect and and directly uh, make some 
economic benefit from renting out a, a home in, I mean, a room in your house. Uh, but there are mechanisms that Airbnb, by working with them, where uh, other states, um, they can collect the hot tax um, and, and remit that directly to the, uh, to the appropriate like revenue tax. So that, that is an option that we can do. I think they had to form a law in Hawaii to make that happen, uh, to authorize them to be a, a tax collector for, um, for the government. Yeah, but overall, we're very, very, um, you know, want to want to hear what everyone here at the roundtable has to say and, and and learn from everyone and and uh, come up with a really good policy. So moving forward, we uh, can all work together and and get all the benefits of tourism without making it a, a nuisance in the the community. But uh, overall, GBB very very supportive of BNBs. Uh, our very our marketing manager, Pilar Laguana, her her mother's had a BNB since the 80s. Um, some of the people that have been coming back 30. 40 times to, to stay at this B&B. &B. Um, and, and we really like the, the culture and the local hospitality that that, that provides, but we also want to protect uh, the local community as well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Senators. Uh, my name is John Camacho. I'm the Director of the Department of Revenue and Taxation. Uh, being, being a regulatory uh, enforcement of, of um, uh, B and B, and and also uh, the aspects of collecting the the uh, GRT taxes as well as the hotel occupancy taxes. Uh, we're here basically to hear everybody's uh, comments and how to improve the, the law that we have, like basically the B and B law, and also maybe make some proposals as uh, having some kind of a more stiffer penalty to actually uh, impose. And we look forward with the legislature to see what we can do. Although we have a cash economy penalty that basically uh, imposes about up to $2,000 already, maybe we need a more stiffer penalty for maybe a higher amount amount that we might want to look. Uh, and the other thing is basically, um, you know, you know, going out there and, and finding people that are illegally functioning out there, uh, not having a proper license. Uh, and it, it doesn't only apply to BNB, but all other businesses. Uh, there's a process, basically, that we follow. And maybe this is something that the legislature can look at. We can't really close the, the, the business down right away. There's a process. There's a legal process. And, and, and we, have, we have to issue citations to these businesses. And basically, they have the right to ask for an appeals. You know, with our with our branch, which is the board, uh, business license board, and and, and the process. So, uh, we're looking forward. We're working with the legislature and all the other agencies here to uh, better improve, you know, the BMB uh, on our island. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Camacho, Mr. Palaz. here and merely looking at the safety and security of our guests uh, and uh, hopefully uh, today we'll learn and also uh, bring in the discussion of what we have in the Guam Hotel Registration for, uh, for the safety also for the residents here and that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Manana Sejus, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the legislature, my name is Clifford Guzman. Um, I've been here in a capacity as a, in support of the Guam Visitors Bureau as a board member, but also as a, as a, as a regular person, a regular Joe out there who's a citizen of Guam. And um, I just want to, I'm, I'm here to listen in as well, but I do want to comment on one thing. Um, about 30 to 40 percent of my travels personally has been you know, all over the world has been um, in bed and breakfasts and vacation rentals. And there is a clear distinction in my mind between the two. Uh, bed and breakfast, again, as, as the chairman rightly pointed out, it's, it's more about getting engaged with the community and understanding and, and feeling that, that home comfort. Um, uh, vacation rentals sometimes can be very cold and you know, here's the key, and you, it's picked, you pick it up from a third person, not even the, the owner, and they give you a list, and then you've got the room, and that's it. And uh, you're lucky if you ever see anybody or anyone ever sees you, and you could have up to 30 people in there and have a party every night. 
And uh, so, and I've experienced that as renting one of the vacation rental rooms as well, where there was a party next door, and I was just upset because they didn't imp invite me. But uh, other than that, there is a clear distinction there. And uh, we need to recognize that as we move forward. And I do recommend that we, we make that clear distinction in the law so that, so that we, we do understand what we're working with. And there may be some adaptations that might have to be done one for the other or whatever, however we're going to do that. Um, but um, I think defining what a bed and breakfast is versus, uh, versus a vacation rental is probably a very good way to start. And then, and then we can see how we can regulate, how we can incentivize, because we want to incentivize people to come to open these things up. It's a good thing, but we want to do it in the right way. And uh, we want to make sure we have enforcement um, uh, procedures in place that, that make sense also. You know? And so um, it's a fine balance. And uh, as the chairman said, uh, the policymakers have a lot of work on their hands. But we're all here to support it. And I uh, just want you to know that. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Milton Morinaga. I sit on the board at the GBBN Charge of Japan Marketing Committee. And um, also, I'm from Hawaii to I see how Hawaii grew from regular hotel to BNB. And there's a rural area where people try to um, rent their homes, uh, an extra bedroom to have the people experience uh, how people live in Hilo or Waimea or whatever. But anyway, like I do agree with everybody. The, the intent of bed and breakfast has been compromised, okay, and, and being very much commercialized, meaning they are renting the home that, um, for for personal um, income, meaning vacation rental and BNB are two different animals, and they need to recognize that. And if you increase more vacation rental, there's a negative impact on that too. With the housing shortage in Guam, if anybody thinks they can rent and sublease it on a daily basis, people who really want to live in Guam will not have enough homes to rent because they're going to be on all vacation rental. Okay, so if you have a lot of condominiums or homes for people moving to Guam, okay but we have limited housing situation, the military coming in, and if all the homes turn into a vacation rental, that's another housing issue that we're gonna come across. The other thing is the safety, I know GPT will, um, will, um, will have a headache too, is in Hawaii there's a lot of crime based on vacation rental, meaning on a website they will advertise, I have vacation rental, you get to stay for one week for 500 bucks, it's cheaper than staying in a hotel, uh, just paying your deposit, I'll meet you at the airport, I'll give you the key. So everybody says, oh, that's a good deal. First of my life that I'm going to go to Hawaii. They come to the airport, the person is not there. No key. They go to the condo, no condo. Who are you? Okay, so they ended up paying $500 a night because last minute booking. And so, okay, GPD comes, oh, not GPD, the HPD comes in. They can't do anything because there's no crime there. They don't know who these guys are. And, and they do have come across with a lot of these problems. And also general liability. If they get hurt in a condo or to bed and breakfast, are they insured enough to protect these people who's visiting? Hotels do have general liability. They slip and fall. Okay, if you stay in a condo or a home, if the cabinet falls on their head, they have a concussion, who pays for it? So that's another who, where can these visitors go and complain? We don't have an agency called Better Business Bureau or Consumer Protection Agency where they can file their complaint and we can regulate who these people are. And that's another thing that we need to help these visitors where they can go and complain. It's not a hotel issue, not a vacation rental issue. There's a lot of other underground economic, um, uh, not economic, uh, someone who compromise on tourism, meaning they don't have license to teach diving they don't have license to really know how to rent a car, and they open up a rental car business or, or diving shop, and, and then undercut everybody who, who has a legitimate business. And, and again, if they get into an accident, who pays for their medical expense? So if they die, what happens? It's a social media again. Oh, Guam is dangerous. I did this and that, and nobody protected me. So anyway, that's one of them. So I think uh, uh, that we need to really be 
careful how we rewrite this bill. And then again, I support everybody's here who just made a comment on vacation rental and B and B definition needs to be clearly stated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murunaga. Mr. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, and I want to thank you for calling this roundtable on a very important uh, topic. I'm here as chairman of the Governor's Council of Economic Advisors. Um, the only comments that I want to make because of, um, are somewhat different um, than, of course, what I support in terms of, um, I'm going to say, illegality. And, and for me, I don't want to downplay the situation because it is illegal. Um, our, our commercial and corporate laws uh, require everybody that is forming an entity to do certain things. And one is the members of the corporation um, have to put their residential addresses that is filed with the Department of Revenue and Taxation, um, in addition, of course, to the office. And the legislative intent when that was uh, created was that so if individuals um, that are members of the corporation don't pay their taxes, then it becomes more uh, easier for the investigative side to find their homes and find them. Um, just the second thing is I, I read some of the articles and some of the bills that are for uh, before lawmakers <coughs> in Hawaii uh, for the appointment of an agent that is totally responsible to make sure that the entity is paying taxes. Um, although our law is somewhat different, I think that in this section we should model the one where um, every entity on Guam that's formed then gets a business license has to also appoint in their articles and bylaws an agent for purposes of receiving service of process if the corporation gets sued. Um, I think as well something we should add for purposes of this bill is an agent for purposes of the responsibility to collect the taxes that are due. Um, so I think there's um, existing laws that can be tweaked a little bit uh, for purposes of uh, uh, this particular subject, so uh, that's all I have to say so far. Madana Suzuza and Hafade, good morning, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chair. My name is Joseph Cruz, and I'm the Chief of Police for the Guam Police Department. I'm here this morning with Lieutenant Joe Carbolito to my left, who's the commander of Tumuning uh, Tumon Precinct Command. Behind me is Captain Steve Ignacio, the commander uh, for Districts 1 and 2, which is primarily our patrol division and Lieutenant Ron Titano, who's the acting commander for my investigations bureau. And we are here on behalf of the Guam Police Department to provide any input, uh, answer any questions, uh, primarily to the safety and security of the people of Guam. That's what we're here for as the Guam Police Department. We are, taking a look, we are here to keep, primarily to keep uh, our people safe, to include the visitors. So as we took a look at this B&B, this, uh, this issue of the B&B, &B, obviously those are visitors coming to our island. Uh, we too have to keep our visitors safe. So while the issue of uh, whether a B&B &B is legal and what have you, though, in our minds, that's a function of, of the Department of Revenue and Taxation. We are here to, to, to provide safety and security. So should these B&Bs become a problem for the community as it's been brought up for the, the children in the community should criminal activity uh, start to occur in this this is where the Guam Police Department then ha very much has a play in ensuring that these B&Bs uh, are safe and are in compliance with our criminal code uh, to ensure the overall safety of our people here on our island so from that perspective is why we are here uh, on behalf of the Guam Police Department and should anybody have any questions or concerns regarding that matter we will be glad to address that Whatever questions we can't field, we'll definitely bring that back to the table again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Senators, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to int introduce myself. Uh, my name is John To. I own a network of bus transportation company. Okay. I've been in the uh, tourism industry for over two decades and I've been uh, actively involved in the in industry. As the Korean tourist arrivals are continuing to reach historical highs, I want to help business to be in uh, compliance with the rules and regulations of the law. I'm in the process of a forming of uh, organization for Korean tourism market stakeholders in hopes to facilitating sit down and discussion with the lawmakers and government officials to ensure that wrongdoings or ignorance of the past can be properly resolved and correct and moving forward. The organization closely mirrored to the tested and proven JGTA in the Japanese tourism industry is open for any stakeholders in the 
Korean market who wish to actively engage in discussions. The organization, organization will also allow continue to accountability within the industry and continue to facilitate discussions and educate business owners to the proper legal means conducting a business on Guam. <coughs> I offer the support from government and private sector stakeholders in for hopes for an even brighter future for Guam tourism. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Mr. Nadeau. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Uh, half a day and good morning. My name is Tom Nadeau with the Division of Environmental Health. I am the Envi Chief Environmental Health Officer with the Department of Public Health. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, our director, Mr. James Gillen, uh, he sends his apology. He had prior commitment. Uh, we at the Division of Environmental Health, we are responsible for the safe and sanitary operation of several health regular establishments, which includes hotels and eating establishments. And depending on how the uh, bed and breakfast operates, uh, it may be regulated by the Division of Environmental Health and we're more than happy to contribute to the discussion to possibly improve the law, maybe even improve our existing law to assist us in our regulation, uh, regulating the bed and breakfast business. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Paul Sablon. I am a bed and breakfast operator, and I also help Mimi run her online listings for her bed and breakfast. Um, the first thing I want to say is the hotels are not happy about this new bed and breakfast law. And I think it's because we offer really high quality product. We offer excellent service. Our staffing, um, if you compare the amount of people on the property, the host, versus the amount of people staying at the property is unsurpassed. I mean, it's practically one-to-one. -one. No hotel offers similar amount of staffing. Safety, we watch our guests. We make sure everything's clean. Um, there, was a, there was a story earlier about um, somebody showing up, the hotel, showing up at the airport in Hawaii and not having anybody there. I'm not saying that doesn't happen in Hawaii, but the model that we embrace when we use sites like Airbnb or Flipkey or these other sites is there, there's a security built in where we have uh, people pay with a credit card, their ratings, and if you look at our ratings, our ratings are the best ratings. We have higher ratings than any hotel on island. And we're talking about little mom and pop operations. We're really safe, we're really secure. Our customers are very happy. And we're, we're stakeholders in this. Um, we, we wanna join GHRA, but my, my application got denied. Okay, and, but but we, we what I what I want to say is we we want to participate. We want to make sure public health comes in. We want to make sure Department of Revenue Taxation gets their taxes. Uh, I submitted uh, an application um, a couple months ago to Department of Revenue Taxation for a business license, and Department of Land Management denied me because they wanted me to do some additional things that weren't in the law. And I, I asked them very clearly, I asked the chief planner, show me in the law where it says I need to do this and I'll comply. And he said, well, we just kind of made it up. <coughs> okay. So we, we want to we be there. Uh, if anyone knows me, um, we, uh, my, my family has been in the tourism business for 30 years. Um, we have one of the most successful large operations in the northern part of Guam. I'm not going to get too much into it, but we're here for the long term. And in many places, in Hawaii, in Guam, in San Francisco, in New York, uh, bed and breakfast operators contribute to the economy. If you want Guam to, be, to have a better tourism product, you have to bring, have more stakeholders. Each of us, when we go out, we're picking up trash. We're making sure our neighborhoods are beautiful. Uh, the people we hire, we tell them the same thing. Hey, don't throw your cigarette butts down. You know, make it nice for our guests. And our employees, when we hire people, know this. And the people that we hire, because we're small operators, we bring them in on, at contract rates, which means they're getting paid 30, 40, 50, 80, 100 dollars an hour to fix our plumbing, to help cut our grass, to help clean our rooms when we can't do it ourselves. So I'll pass it on to Mimi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sublan. Ms. Mimi? Manana <laughs> Situs. My name is Mimi Santos, and I've lived in Guam almost 40 years. I live in the beautiful little village of Toto in the heart of Guam. 
And I've been in tourism for a long time. I've been with Air Nauru, Continental. I've been with Lucky Limo and Limousine Express, so I have a tour guide license. Um, I've been with Umidori Cruises and Stars and Stripes. And I thought it was a great idea to, when I was driving uh, and with tourists, to show them our island and our home. So when I came up with the idea, I, I, it was brand new to me. I've never stayed in a bed and breakfast, except my own. And um, I went to UOG, and I enrolled there uh, in business. And I was um, in the women in business class, and it was um, very enlightening. And we came up with the idea a bit of a bed and breakfast, that I can host people. And although that they said because of my property size, I could have had more um, room, I only wanted one. I wanted to be able to attend to one family of guests and show them our island, show them our home, be hospitable. Um, it's, it's just part of me. And I would like others to do that too. Um, this came to light in recent days of uh, 2016. Um, and from my inception of, of uh, having people in, I went straight to Tax and Rev and asked for a bed and breakfast license. This was in the year 2000. They said, breakfast in bed, what is it? We don't know. They had no clue. So there was nothing on the books when I went. And I want, it, I want to. So we did have another license, which is um, a service license, which things we put into that because we cut grass. And you got, you know, you got what you, uh, but I would like the real license, I would like it to be established here where, and it's not a secret. I know many of you in this room know I have a bed and breakfast. Some of you have been to my house. So it's not a secret, but I do only uh, use online. Um, we've had wonderful people. And online, I, I check them out. I talk to them. We, uh, we find their hot buttons. What do they like to do? Um, they interact with our family, my husband and I, uh, before with my grandchildren. And we have, have just had so many... <coughs> I mean, not like a million. I'm not a hotel, but we've had so many great people that are my friends still. Christmas cards, uh, uh, Facebook, and they and return and returning. And so, I want to have this all legal. I want it to be, uh, you know, understood what Airbnb is versus. Uh, bed and breakfast with a host family that that can tell you where where um, places are, but you don't force them. Uh, you know, this is my business, and happy to uh, never have a problem with the police, never have a problem with my neighbors. My guests are just fine. So, thank you, Sizus Maasi. Ben Provenza, Mrs. Santos. Thank you for sharing. Chief. Good morning. I'm Chief Manabusen. I'm the fire marshal with the Guam Fire Department. The Guam Fire Department's role is for fire code enforcement and enforcement of life safety. The only concern that the fire department has is, of course, uh, fire code compliance. And just a couple of things that uh, we are concerned with is just being able to know who's tracking the locations of all the bed and breakfasts and signage which must be visible from the road now because of the nature of these operations they're bringing the public into their homes so we need to know their locations in terms of fire code enforcement it's already clear that if you go to the handouts that were given on page two they're classifying them as r1s and r2s so basically we would treat it as an r1 and r2 and basically the only difference is an R1 is transient in nature, and an R2 is 
a little bit more permanent in nature. Now they can both overlap and we do have examples of that in the hotels such as Verona and uh, Pia Marine. So this is not something new to the fire department. It's just at a smaller scale. But we would treat it as an R1 and R2. You can call it bed and breakfast. You can call it breakfast and bed. We would treat it as a R1 and R2. And of course, we're always available for uh, giving consultation and whatever uh, fire department needs that you have, you can call us up. We're in full support of the law and that's what we do, just we'll enforce the law. Thank you. You're welcome, Chief. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Deanna Palmer. I'm the 2016 president of Guam Association of Realtors. Um, I'm not here yet speaking for the realtors, but I can talk about what we do as realtors. We, we follow the laws. We, um, we know that in our market over the last five years, vacation rentals and bed and breakfast requests have skyrocketed especially the last couple of years. People um, coming to Guam want this as an option for staying on Guam. Owners of properties want it as an option to get a license and provide that service. Developers or investors, whether they're on island investors or new people to Guam investing in Guam, also see that as um, a great investment. It's a great opportunity for the island to to give a different experience of coming to Guam. Also for our local residents, when they have families, they have big events, sometimes quite frankly there isn't enough space in their home and they would like to participate with using a bed and breakfast or a vacation rental. I recently used an Airbnb in San Diego for the first time and it was scary because it's new, but it worked out great and stayed in somebody's home and it was more of a more of a room and a bathroom and then I took care of all my other things um, I see it as a great opportunity realtors follow the laws we also have a code of ethics we are we are required to have fair dealing with the public with the realtors community so we're sort of held at a higher standard. We are not an enforcement agency. <coughs> so we advise owners, this is what you need to do. If you're purchasing on Guam and you're not a US citizen, you need to become a US corporation. We send them to attorneys, we send them to CPAs, we send them to the land management, to the licensing board. We facilitate them getting things done, however, it's their responsibility to make sure it happens. I'm really positive with what I've heard so far this morning. I think there are some differences that need to be addressed with regards to renting out a room in your home versus a whole unit. Love the idea of maybe incorporating the Airbnb and having them collect the, the extra tax and sending it to Government of Guam. If we could make that happen, that's a great option. And it's all doable, it's at the moment very complicated, but it's great to have a great team of people to work on it. So I appreciate being here and being invited. Thank you. You're welcome, Deanna. Half a day, good morning. My name is Bart Jackson. Uh, I'm sit currently sit on the board of the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association and the Guam Visitors Bureau and the Guam Chamber of Commerce. I'm the previous chairman of the GHRA and was the chairman for a total of 10 years. And I want to say uh, very directly, uh, the GHRA, the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association, and the Guam Visitors Bureau, neither organization is anything but supportive to the creation of a B&B &B industry. There is nothing we've done, nothing we've said, which is against those basic concepts. We are, however, against those who break the law. It's pretty straightforward for us. We support the industry. We support legislation which will improve the opportunity to regulate the industry. Uh, it's not just a, a bed and breakfast or guest house problem, but clearly we are, we are not against those things. I, in some ways, I guess I'm responsible for us all being here today because it was my interview which kind of got things going. And uh, in that regard, I would like to say that, that this issue 
is not a Korea market problem. This issue is a tourism problem. It's a revenue tax problem. It is not a single market problem. It does impact the Korean tourism market more than the other markets because of its size and because of its structure. But this is not an opportunity for anyone or any organization to bash that industry or bash that source market. This is an island problem, uh, a problem for all of us. And we began to, to uh, identify the problem when if you look online and you look on any of the websites in, in the source markets, you can see there are listings for in excess of 100 locations. Excess of 100. Yet if you go to Revin Tax and ask how many are registered, they'll tell you somewhere between 15 and 20. Well, that's a pretty big difference. Clearly, when there are over 100 places that are advertising and only 15 to 20 that are registered, we have a problem. And so we've been talking about this problem internally within the, the Hotel Association and within the Visitors Bureau for about a year, for about a year. And, and I'm really uh, pleased that it's finally getting some traction because it's important that we be supportive of this segment of our tourism economy. I don't know what other people have heard or they're, they're, they're guessing at what our intent is, but clearly I can tell you we have nothing but support for this segment of the industry as long as it's done properly. And as we fix this problem, and, and clearly this is a great first step, thank you, Senator, to fixing the problem, there are other problems within the tourism economy that also need to be fixed, and that is unlicensed and unregistered optional tours who don't carry enough insurance in case there's an accident tour agents who aren't registered and licensed and approved tour agents, rental car companies, taxi companies. This is really just the tip of the iceberg. It may be the biggest part of the iceberg, but uh, these are, are companies that come to Guam and they don't, there, there are rules and regulations for the establishment of these businesses and for whatever reason they choose to ignore those and do basically whatever the hell they want. And that's not right. And so uh, as a board member of the Hotel Association and the Visitors Bureau and the Chamber of Commerce, I can say that what we want is for people to comply with the law. And if the laws don't work, let's work together to fix them. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Okay. Hoffa Aids and Buenas. I apologize. Um, probably got sick the same time but my voice is not normally this deep but I apologize I know I, I can still project and pretty big talk pretty loudly so hopefully I'll be clear um, my name is Mary Rhodes I'm the president for the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association I've been there for about 10 years now um, but you know GHRA for those who don't know the history, GHRA is a non-profit non-government organization it was actually created 44 years ago in with this kind of purpose. The hoteliers really wanted to get together so that we can um, talk about government regulations and how to improve the industry and the service standards and things like that. So because this is a growing trend uh, internationally, not just here, but internationally, this is a very good opportunity and I wanna thank our chairwoman um, to really pull this together because we've had discussions even with Attorney General uh, Alicia Lim Tiako, um, I'm sorry, not Attorney General, but yes, um, yes, with, uh, we, we've had these discussions on what the issues have been this last year. And I really want to say that, yes, this is an opportunity. It's great to see all the government agencies because I think this is a endemic uh, situation where we always know between public health, revenue tax, fire department, Guam Police Department, what the issues are but they're not all connected a lot of the times. And I think that's where an opportunity with the legislature can come up with uh, improved ordinances to make your jobs easier, especially when it comes to enforcement. And so GHRA together with GVB is in support of this. We realize this is an opportunity to really streamline a lot of things, create standards, which is what I think is missing. There are no standards to how this is done. And with regards to even our membership, GHRA is a 44-year-old organization. And we don't charge by one room. We actually charge over 100 rooms. 
And so this is something we're going to be bringing up with our board um, to allow a member like yourself. So it wasn't so much denied. It was just in a holding pattern because we still need to come up with rates for our uh, bed and breakfast or other businesses to um, identify. Otherwise, you're going to pay 100 rooms even though you don't have 100 rooms, basically. So... Well, I'm just bringing that up. So we are going to be discussing at uh, the GHA board with how to deal with this. We constantly do. But again, it's a par opportunity um, to partner with all the stakeholders, both government and the private sector, uh, because we, uh, you know it's been a growing issue. Um, but honestly, like Bart said, this is not just a Korean market. We know also the Chinese and the Russian tourists have really been staying at long stay homes and vacation rentals. Um, and that's what we want. We want long stays. We want, we've been trying to get more longer stays out of our tourists and the hotels sometimes just aren't available for long stays. So as Mark had mentioned, we have our peak, non-peak periods. The hotels have already bookings with all of our agents. Sometimes it's very difficult for a hotel to even give up a room or much less five rooms for three weeks to one family. So this is an opportunity for all of us to really grow the industry in an in area that we already know is growing regardless if we're participating or not. It is an underground industry. We just want it to be above board. We want it to be credentialed, certified. We want the ordinances in place. We want to ensure safety and security in our tourism industry. We want to make sure we grow this in the proper, most organic way that's the best for Guam, our <coughs> residents, and all of our tourists. And so on behalf of GHRA, our board, and all of our members, our main goals are to improve service standards and to advocate, truly advocate the government regulations. And all the government agencies we partner with, they know. That's like the main thing I really focus on. And I want to make sure that everybody, whether you're a member or not a member of GHRA, we don't have advocate just on our members. We advocate on the industry and what's right for the industry. And so this is the right thing to do. I'm so glad that we have this opportunity, but we need to not just have the legislature involved, we need to make sure all the government agencies are really on board because as the realtors are with their non-government non organization, we are not an enforcement agency. We can only recommend, we can only provide guidelines, we can provide best examples from other markets, and I have provided um, our chairwoman with examples from other markets of how this is managed. Um, with the ordinances and what other things we can look at. Um, GHRA is interested in looking at not just in this industry, as Bart mentioned. There are other types of business sectors within tourism that need the same time of streamlining and standards that are set forth. So I'm very um, grateful for this opportunity to speak and I look forward to continue partnering with all of you and welcoming and educating and providing the training and certifications for all of those who do work in the tourism industry because you are part of the industry. You already are. You have been for a very long time. It's an opportunity for us to provide the proper training and education and help with building that alliance and bridges with government agencies. That is the heart of what we do at GHRA. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Rhodes. <coughs> Mr. Bustamante. Good morning. Good morning, Senator. I want to thank you in advance for uh, holding this uh, roundtable. Uh, I want to thank the members. Uh, first of all, uh, the reason I am here is because I am a resident of one, a businessman, a real estate broker and developer. And I have noticed that this has been happening, but, you know, it didn't happen to me. So I figured it out the agencies will enforce this. Then my son almost got run over. And then I figured it out, well, you have these people that come to Guam, which, you know, we want them to come, and we want them to stay in the hotels if they want a five-star service, or stay on a bed and breakfast when you get a three-star service, you know. But you have to follow the law. We have laws in place. You know, you have revenue and tax that has a law, which is law 32045, as I've indicated many times, this law was creating an effort to grow the economy. And in order to increase opportunities for a small business development and a residence of one, which it means it was created for the locals. If you have a house and you own, you own your home, and you must live in the home, like Mimi does, because I was there with my wife when we got married in 2007, and it was a great service, because I couldn't afford a hotel. 
$250 hotel. So I went over there and I got a great service. Yeah? So the thing is, if you comply with the law and you follow the law and get your license and you pay your taxes and you pay your GRT, then it's no problem for you to run a business. I want you to make money like I am making money. The problem that we're having right now is some of these operators, they get a license, they rent a house through an owner, write a lease agreement, and said, I'm going to stay there with my wife and my kids. And now they have 20, 40 people living in, in the house for two, three, four, five days, regardless of what it is, Korean, Chinese, Russian, whatever it is. The thing is, if I go to the hotel, I travel a lot. If I go to the hotel and I check in the hotel, the first thing they're going to ask me is my passport. So at that point, I am registered. They are not going to give me my passport until I pay the bill. Guess what? If we have people that go to these bed and breakfasts or guest house or vacation rental, and then I rent a place and they don't ask me for my passport, they don't ask me for any documentation, what happens if I am a child molester? And then I go next door and I see kids like my kids and I take a king and I rape it behind the bonus. And then I go to, to the house, pack my stuff, and I leave. Who I hold accountable as a resident, as a father? I have a problem. And that's why I am here. And this is what I created. I, I give you some suggestions as a real estate broker, as a father, as a citizen of one, as a resident. This is my home. I've been here for 10 years. We need to stiffen and toughen our laws in order to deter many unscrupulous operators. Those that don't follow the law need to be stopped. Those that are following the law, guess what? You have our support. Right now, and I tell you this because I've been so persistent with revenue and tax, and I appreciate Mrs. Benito and Mr. Camacho trying to do the best that we can, but we have a law that is not clear. It's very clear, no offense, it was not written properly, and it was passed, and it's leaving a lot of angles that you can get in, and, and, and nothing is in place. I know that this is going to create an extra effort for GPD, which I know you guys are busy, but it's a way that we can prevent for GPD to coming in right away. And this is by toughing a loss. Right now we have a 500 law uh, 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 fine. They're making 1000 to $2,000 a night. You give me a 500 okay. Next time you come back, it's another week. I keep doing that all day. Then 2000 I filed three complaints. I have pictures. This individual has been fined $500. And they've been operating for three weeks. I meet with Mr. Benito three times. And I have videos, pictures. they saying, we cannot do anything, Mr. Bustamante. Guess what? You change the first offense to $25,000. Hawaii does it. They charge you $50,000. Hong Kong does it. You put $25,000, boom, it's stop. That's it. Second, you don't listen. We find out, or revenue and tax find out that you did it again, $50,000, and close with the BNB immediately. It's a lot of things that has been brought up today, and you know basically it's covering everything that I talk about it. You put a sign in the door that says bed and breakfast. You have to have security. If you're going to have tourists coming from Korea, from China, from Russia, from wherever they can, and they come into Guam, and we're going to open our home for hospitality, then you have to provide them with safety. If, and one of the things that you have to do, you must live in the home like Mimi does. But I am talking about when you're running a, a one room, it's okay. But when you're running four, five, six rooms, then you have to have security. Another thing that it has to be done, you have to have a liability insurance. Mr. Escro, Mr. Morinaga mentioned it. I fall in the house. I broke my leg. Who I go? Who I sue? Who take care of me? Nobody. We don't have laws in one that protect our tourists for the bed and breakfast. That's something that has to be established. And, you know, third offense, I don't know if you guys or not. Having a business without a license is a criminal offense. It's a misdemeanor. What are we doing? Where is the lack of support with the agencies? We have to come together and figure it out. You know, you, you, you give the third time to somebody, you, you, you've been fined 25, 50,000. The third time, you go to jail, two, three years. That's it. 
It's very simple. Number two, revenue and tax need more inspectors. I understand they only have four inspectors to supervise 4,000 establishments. That's crazy. I'm sorry. You know, we have to be able to support them if we expect that this job is done. And I'm sorry. Uh, if you can pass that down, please. I'm sorry. Number three, requirements. To operate a BMB, you must own the home and you must reside on the home in order to service the guests. Service the guests properly. You must have a license for BMB issued by revenue and tax and approved by all governmental agencies. Doesn't mean because you get your license, then okay, I am not going to do anything. I have optional tours, I have barbecues in the house, and department of <coughs> public help doesn't come and inspect your home. If you want to run a hotel business, because it's a hotel business, it's a small scale of a hotel, you have four rooms, five rooms, and you have to abide by those laws. You must pay your GRT and taxes, like I do pay my GRT and taxes, like everybody else pay your GRT and taxes. That's the law. If you get paid, and I know this for a fact, you have these bed and breakfasts that they collect in the monies overseas, stay overseas, and then the people come to Guam and they don't pay taxes and they're making $20,000 a day or 15 or 10. Where the money goes? We need the money to fix our roads, our schools. B and B must be regulated by the fire department, Department of Public Health, and other governmental entities in order to provide a better protection to our tourists and our visitors. All B and B must obtain a third party risk insurance in order to minimize all liabilities on the village, our residents and the B and B establishment. All B and B must provide a 24 hour front desk counter and security in order to provide good service and safety. Moreover, licensed B and B or guest houses are required to display the licensed logo at the main entrance and on the doors of all guest rooms in accordance with the license conditions. You are only allowed to have one B and B house that you must operate. Now you have people from overseas, they come to one, they rent from homes, and they take advantage of the law that we created. What is that? This is crazy. Um, we must enforce the proper screening at the airport. That's where they come first. They come to the airport, you, where are you going? You're going to this guest house. Let's find out if they register. If they are not, let's make a phone call and let's track them down. Same thing with the drivers, the taxis. If they know, because if I go to a place and I take a taxi, a taxi, I personally can decide where I go. Nobody can tell me where I need to go. But the taxi can know if he's taking me to a place that is not safe, he can record the address and provide it to the, to the agencies. Any person to apply and obtain a BB or guest house license, it must be a U.S. citizen and a resident of one for a minimum of five years. Obviously, we created this law for the locals, right? So you live here, this is your home. So let's make it a requirement. You need to be in one a resident for five years. If the BNB is a corporation, then all members of the corporation may be a resident of one for five years. Number six, is a, if a house is rented to a person as a residential house, and then the leasee or tenant runs a BNB business, then the leasey or tenant shall be fined $50,000 because they lie. It's fraud. You deceive. You wrote an agreement and you breach your agreement. And the owner will be, now, the owner of the house, he didn't know anything, hopefully. So the owner of the house will be give, given a written warning to terminate the lease agreement in five days due to breach of contract. If the landlord fails to do so, then the landlord will be fined $20,000 and $2,000 per day until the tenants are vacated. That money is going to stay in one, and you will see. You will, you will have one, two, three, but it will stop right there because our laws are stiffing and are tough. Like Bar Jackson indicated, this is not about the Koreans, this is not about the Chinese, this is not about the Russians, this is about the operators that are working illegally. And I will say something as I said, because I work very hard Monday to Monday. 
and I pay my taxes. So it's not fair that somebody come next door and do all these things that are illegal in order to make big bucks and take it back where they came from. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. At this time, I'd like to open uh, to my colleagues. Vice Speaker, please. Vice Chair. Thank you very much. I really do think that, um, I think Clifford hit it on the head. There really has to be a distinction. I've traveled a lot, and I've stayed in bed and breakfast, and um, that is a, an operation like Mimi's or, or, or Mrs. Athlegui's, where it is a home, and she makes sure that she feeds you at least breakfast, if not more meals. Um, and that, that we should make sure that we define that specifically as a bed and breakfast. I've also traveled and taken advantage of Airbnb. And Airbnb is, you're met at the airport, you're taken to the residence, and you, you know, I, I stayed in some places. It was in Istanbul in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, no, it was in the middle of the city, but it was very difficult. But it was, it was a, but it was an absolute beautiful apartment. I'm, um, you know, and, and it's a great way to travel if it's a group of you and you all want to be able to be together. You can rent uh, an apartment, um, and so those were my experiences with with B and B. And in the 80s and the 90s, I had a vacation rental in Honolulu. And I know what that's like to own a vacation rental and, and, the, and the problems that you have. And I think those three need to be distinctly <coughs> separated. And then there is the whole issue, at least a few realtors have come to talk to me about having a fourth one of um, <coughs> shared ownership of of homes um, and uh, and how that's going to going to be handled and so we have to decide which part of this elephant we're going to take take <coughs> on first and which bites going to be addressed because I think it um, you have to dis do a specific definition for bed and breakfast and it's not B and B I didn't realize that we were so, I, I don't think we're, we're that late to the table. I was surprised when Saturday evening when I was reading my iPad that Hawaii is, I think, right now discussing on the floor a, a piece of legislation. I think, yeah, Wednesday. Uh, they're discussing legislation on this issue. Uh, so we're not too late to the table. And Florida just passed theirs in December. So it's, we're, we're not really behind the curve. I, I would have thought that Hawaii had all of this addressed because when I had the vacation rental in the 80s and the 90s, um, I, my realtor had the keys to my condo and um, she was the one that <coughs> had it cleaned and, and ready for the next person to come. And I finally gave it up because every time I wanted to go to Hawaii, I could never get into the rental myself. I said, never mind. Um, but those, we have to figure out that there are, are, are several things that have to be addressed at this table. And, we, and I think the B&Bs should not be included in the Airbnb one because that's, that, that may be completely different. Um, uh, there's no, at least in my experience, and, and I did it in Czech Republic and, and in Turkey, um, and there was no, nobody to feed me, but there was a really good guide that brought me to the place, gave me the keys, and took me back to the airport um, from the uh, condos that we were living in. So we have quite an interesting task ahead of us, but, but I'm glad that everybody realizes that in order for all of us to build the tourism industry, that all have to coexist. Um, and um, I would love to see more B, real B&Bs that are out there. Um, that, and, uh, and I understand that 
Milton's concern about housing, it's, it's, it's real, but the realtors and the investors want to invest in something that they think they can make a little more money than, and they're, they've come to me about shared ownership or um, vacation rentals uh, or, or uh, fact, factional, yeah. And so that's a discussion that I'm having separately. Um, so I, I'm not sure what we're going to address today, but we have several, several levels that have to be addressed, and uh, each one of them has to be done separately. And I, I'm embarrassed that we didn't notice the difference between that when we passed the initial legislation a couple of years ago. But we'll, we'll get it corrected. Uh, C2S Moss, <coughs> as your uh, vice chair, and you bring up a lot of good points, especially uh, as in your relationship and, and your experience from traveling uh, to all these different places. I do have a lot of my colleagues that are behind me, and at this time I'm going to ask Senator Adams, do you have any comments or questions? Senator Torres? Just please. To the Realtors Association, do we have any, um, do we have to be cognizant also about the, the new developments and properties that the gated communities and whether that, that has uh, any conflict with some of their ordinances or their rules? I'm sorry, Ms. Deanna, can you go ahead and speak into the, the mic, please, so our listening audience when there, can listen. When there is a homeowners association, the association will have um, their bylaws and their rules and what they allow and what they don't allow. Um, and most associations don't allow a business in a residential area. However, they allow the business license for rentals so that um, the owner of the unit can rent out the property. Um, in regards to vacation rental or bed and breakfast type rental, um, it may be occurring and it's again one of those things where the law isn't clear and um, the association um, can, you know, find their owners, um, but they can't give tickets. So we need to address it in the law in a way so that it could be enforced. Because right now an association, a homeowners association is very much like a Guam Association of Realtors. It's, it's just an association. We don't have, we don't have enforcement, right? We just, with our members, we have enforcement. Yeah, yeah and, and I brought it up because I, I think that when you invest in that type of a residence, mm -hmm. that there's you know there, there's a premium to having a lifestyle. And, Correct. And, That's and, what and, people are buying. Right, right. Right. And so so you know I I just want to make sure that when we start to craft those those allowances, that it's it's mindful of those privileges that people are entitled to as well. Um, depending upon what the association allows. Correct. So I think just that simple kind of verbiage, something to that effect, right. okay. would be enough. Um, I don't know, with revenue and tax, they are already don't have enough people. For them to know, even though they have copies <coughs> of all the association's rules, bylaws, for them to know each property and what is allowed and what isn't allowed in order to give a license is going to cause a license to not be given because they can't know everything. So um, so I, I see it as, a, as an obstacle for licensing. Whereas um, even on, a, on an Airbnb or an, a bed and breakfast if you had um, <coughs> even just a, a rental, a regular rental license for the property, which is very attainable, um, at least you would have the 4% coming, you know, you would have GRT coming in um, to rev and tax. Um, yeah. Speaker. I think it would depend on the horizontal regime that yeah, you yeah. write for the 
for the for the condo association or for the for the, the legal the legal yeah. document that yeah. creates it. Yeah. yeah, because I yeah the HPR is 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 written. I know ours was written to make sure that we don't weren't have going that. to be happening. Yeah, <laughs> it was not going to be allowed in our in our building, but. There are some well, buildings that, that can and are being used that way, mm -hmm. and I think their HPRs allow for that. And some uh, associations or HPRs may, may want to change to allow it. Um, this, this is a new thing, and the, the governing documents for so many of the buildings that were built in the 90s and that time frame, we didn't consider this as an option That's right. so it's not addressed um, uh, so so that's why the licensing part we have to address it there yeah but but the horizontal um, property regime is filed with land management it is so it there there is a place to check for it if if they want to but I really do think it's the eight homeless so homeowners association that polices it to make sure that you don't have the wild parties next door. <laughs> any <laughs> to, any to any make, resident can call the police yeah. for noise. Yeah, you know that is our right as um, whether I'm renting or I own. Um, I live here and I'm protected by Guam Police Department if it's out of control. Sure. Um, and thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, Senator Torres. Any. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Murunaga wanted to comment. Yes, um, I, I did some development, resort development in Big Island, and, and also timeshare business too. And everything, um, all the people who's involved, like timeshare, you got to have a real estate license, okay, because it involves uh, investment. And so, you know, those kind of things, because and real estate license is difficult to take. You got to go classes and you got to get state license and all that. So there are a licensed entity that can regulate the business. Okay, it's like vacation rental too. If I have a home, I have the realtor become our agent like the Senator Cruz did. Um, they are the one who is my agent to do the vacation rental. And to answer your question about, a good example is um, Manalani Resort, Big Island. The resort itself does not allow timeshare, or but vacation rental is okay, okay. But no bed and breakfast because they don't do that kind of business. But but on Big Island, there's a place called Waikoloa Resort. They allow timeshare. So now that place is maybe two hotels. The rest is all condominium turned into timeshares. So you know, it's all we need to depend on the real estate agent too to regulate a lot of the business on vacation rentals too. Um, like Bart said, you know, we're, we're not against any Airbnb or BNB and, and that is a good way to introduce our island and, 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 as, uh, uh, and, and hotel is not against and we're, we're one of the biggest hotel owner and we welcome this business Airbnb or BNB. Please speak into the yes. CCR is what is called covenants and restrictions. And then you have the horizontal property regime that is used for condominiums. The problem that we're having is that we were not expecting, if you allow me to explain, Diana, we were not expecting for this to create a problem for Guam. B and B, guest house, vacation rental. So as a senator indicated to my right, we have to be able to define bed and breakfast, vacation rentals, and guest houses. To me, I will put those three the same. That's it. You cannot be doing something for someone and then do something else for another one because at the end of the day, these businesses are here to serve our tourists. And the main thing is they have to be pro protected. Their safety is important. And we, as residents, our safety and our family's safety is important as well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mary? Yeah, I think that, um, I think today is really to address all the concerns and the next steps are really to outline the changes to the, potential changes to the law that we want to look at with the dis different classifications. And I think that's what it's missing are the classifications. And as long as the standards are uniformed, like 
maximum occupancy, um, signage, you know, all the liability insurance, things like that. I think that those things need to be outlined next. And so I think uh, this is where probably we need to, uh, because I think we can keep going back and forth on the different um, philosophies of what one serves and which one's needs are met. Um, but I think we're all in agreement that our laws need to be updated. And that's why we're here. Um, but I would like to ask our Madam Chair and Vice Chair that as we continue to update these laws, I did provide copies um, from Hong Kong and then also Hawaii that uh, Milton had mentioned um, for examples of what we've been looking at of where you can set these standards. Uh, there's also some additional things that uh, destinations like Hong Kong do uh, where they look at standards for not just inbound but outbound um, where there's other responsibilities for other business sectors. Um, because even though we address the issues with guest houses or Airbnb and B&B, &B, um, there are a lot of services provided within there. And I think this is probably like where Tom would be concerned about with health certificates and Guam EPA would be wor worried about pesticide certification and things like that. There's a lot of other government <laughs> regulations that aren't being addressed here. And I wanna make sure that when we do address the rules and regs, with regards to the ordinances that we look at everything else required in order to operate and to provide a safe and secure environment for, within these businesses. That's with respect to not just the tourists, but the residents of Guam. Senator Jim, as well, Don, any comments? Thank you. Um, I also would like to extend to anyone sitting uh, in the audience, if you'd like to have any comments or, yes, please come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Tay O. Oh. Um, I'm actually a, a longtime resident of uh, Guam. I've gone to school here, I grew up here. Um, you know, I've heard all the discussion up here and it, it does concern me a little bit, um, especially when it comes to regulations and uh, especially when it comes to uh, certain type of restrictions. Uh, I myself um, run a few businesses here. Uh, I decided to get into the guest house business about a year ago. Um, we've been operating at a very high quality rate um, uh, our customers are very satisfied. What bothers me is the fact that I, I do understand that a few bad apples can ruin it for the rest. Okay. What I'm asking though is that, please, um, I, I, I don't see, uh, I, I don't, I, I could understand how a few bad apples can ruin it for the rest, but at the same time, for legit operators like us, it just, is, is at an unfair advantage uh, to have a front desk staff to have you know all these regulations and to to have these restrictions these proposed restrictions when we legit operators have been running this in a very you know we've been abiding by all the laws we've been paying our 11 percent tax so uh, we ask that, please, keep that in mind, okay? Thank you. Mr. Cole? Madam you... Chair, I have uh, three questions. I'll make it real quick. Do we have Airbnb uh, policies in legislature right now? Uh, no, we don't. We are looking into that right okay. now. Okay. Uh, one for Mr. Blaus and uh, Mr. Noriega. Uh, go Milton? ahead and address it to yeah. you, Mr. Cole. Thank you. No. <laughs> um, the Airbnb, right? Uh, let's say um, now the networking online, when they book a hotel room through the Expedia hotel booking.com and all, I'm pretty sure that you guys collect money after 30 days. Then uh, do you guys pay occupancy taxes when you receive money from yeah. online booking? Yeah, address it to the chair. Okay. Okay. Mr. Morinaga, you're more than welcome to either answer it or we can reserve the comment and then yeah, get the reserve answer. Reserve the comment because right now I need to... Yes. That's just a question. Yeah. So Thank you. Reason my question was uh, asked to you, all these guest houses and B&B, right, operated by Koreans, uh, many of them came by, you know, my office uh, like yeah. weekend. 
we can just leave it open okay, and sure. not to all the ethnic groups no, that are here on Guam. They're confused right now. All the bookings made by networking online. Okay. So we do we have an online policy to pay 11% tax? And that is exactly okay. what we're looking at, and that's why this meeting was right, very important. Give, just, give, just to give you the copy of the copies of the, the type of license they got issued by Revenue and Tax. Okay. Okay. So we will go ahead and look at these uh, personally, and then work with the proper uh, government agency to follow through. Fair enough. And then based on the questions that you ask, and that's why we ask for everybody who's here, please sign in because the question may be, his question may be your question also. And if you want a response from us as policymakers and from the government agencies, it would be good to have your information so that we can refer the answers to you. Yeah. Madam Chair. You're more than welcome. Uh, and at this time, uh, Miss Mary has a comment. So, um, Mr. Ko, with regards to the 11% tax, whether it's done online or through like an agent, it honestly it depends because it depends on the contracts that the hotels have. Whether you're a small operator or a large operator, every hotel is required to pay 11% occupancy tax based on nights sold. Just because they have reservations does not mean that they're staying, right? So sometimes the agents could book, let's say, 30,000 room nights, but they only get 25,000 room nights, so they pay that. Um, but usually with the, eight, with the way the nights are sold, some contracts have it inclusive of 11%, where the rate's already included, or it's additional so the answer is really it depends and it depends on your contracts with each of the district uh, sales channels that you might have whether it's online or through agents oh chairman uh, can i have yeah, a comment yeah. hold on hold on i'm going to go ahead and, and and answer first give the opportunity i will talk to mr moranaga mr sablon and then i will ask john some of the questions so no mr moranaga go ahead and state your comment we, we do we do our business in Guam. So every payment that we charge or to be paid to our establishment or to a hotel, the taxes are paid here. Okay, so like you say, Mary, the contract or whatever, everything gets paid here and we pay the appropriate tax that's required. It doesn't matter where you book it, how it's booked, the payment is all made here. If it's not made or prepaid elsewhere, we send an invoice with the tax included and then they will pay the tax. Simple. Mr. Sublon? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for showing up today. And I, I want to say as a B&B &B operator, it really hurts to hear some of these comments. We offer a really high quality product and some of these proposed regulations will absolutely kill us. Many of you have small businesses or have families that have small businesses and you know some of the smallest regulations can have a huge detrimental impact on your business if you look at our ratings you look at what we've been providing you'll see that we're we provide something that the hotels can't and Guam's faced with a, a problem where we're getting all the low-end tourists and we need to offer something that's really high quality to attract these visitors that that will spend the money that we want them to spend. And this is how we can do it. Um, there's huge growth potential. I mean, this is something that's not mentioned. I mean, our B&B &B operations right now are at 100 rooms, roughly. And um, it's actually less than that. Because, for instance, I have two rooms, but the way that we, we put it out there, it looks like six. Because of the combinations and things we do, and that's an Airbnb policy but it can grow a lot. It can grow 10 times. And we still wouldn't be at the saturation point that New York is at or uh, San Francisco's at. And tourism isn't their biggest industry. So there's a lot of potential. Um, you know, us operators that are in, in it for the long haul, we want to make sure our guests are safe. Absolutely. But just give us a chance to grow. Give us a chance to establish ourselves. Um, it's it's obvious some of the, some of these people are here trying to vilify 
the B&B operators. It's, it's pretty clear. Um, all sorts of stories. None of those stories are associated with us, thankfully. Uh, if, if any of you would like to see an actual B&B in operation, I, I'd love to invite anybody to come see my operation. Thank you. See for yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sapon. I do have Senator Espaldon who would like to comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, actually, this co a question is for Mr. O. I'm glad you joined back at the table. Uh, you clearly distinguished uh, the businesses that you operate as a guest house. That's right. Uh, as opposed, and, and I just want to perhaps get your thoughts on why you call yourself a guest house versus a bed and breakfast or rather, or even a vacation rental? Um, when I was speaking earlier, I don't think I made that distinction very clear. But at the same time, you know, when you, when you call a business bed and breakfast, they normally serve food. I don't think we would be considered a bed and breakfast. We'll probably be more in line with a service, service uh, rental. Uh, or I, I, what, what was the... Ex Vacation rental, there you go. A vacation rental and a guest house. Um, the distinction between the two, you know, it's really hard for me. I, I don't know if, I, I guess, I'm hoping someone could tell me what the exact distinction between the two is. I, but and, I, and, I, and I just want to interject on that based sure. on what was asked earlier mm -hmm. and some of the licenses that were received. I do have a couple of questions uh, for DRT. Uh, I may not want to get, I may ask for the answer a little bit later, but uh, Senator M Jimmy, I, you can continue. Uh, thank you. No, and I, I, I want to say that we do have some things that we need to talk to Reverend Tex about. I, I appreciate yeah. it, Manager. I just wanted to get Mr. O's sure. take because he identified himself as, as a proprietor of uh, a okay. guest house. So I just was wondering if there was a distinction that we could work with according to his thoughts. I do have a question also for the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association in terms of um, Mrs. Blonde did say, I guess he, he, he applied to be a member and he was denied. You have a different take on what was happening there. The real question is, in light of, the, uh, of this now as a, as a developing part of the, of the tourism economy, does the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association plan to perhaps create uh, room for membership for the smaller operators who may be the guest house or bed and breakfast and maybe even work with them to try to define what standards and what uh, regulations and rules might be more applicable to them considering their small size as opposed to a hotel. Yes. Um, yeah, that's, that's why we're going to be bringing it at the upcoming board meeting, which is on Wednesday. Um, our classifications are, let's say, if you're a restaurateur, it's less than so many tables. Same with the hotels. If you have less than 100 rooms, you pay a flat rate. Um, with the application, we received eight, uh, the $8.95. That's on a per-room basis if you're over 100 rooms. So that's why I was saying right now for any... B&B or guest houses or uh, rentals, we don't have something, we don't have a category for saying one room. Our minimum is 100. Because you have to remember when it was created 44 years ago, it was created as a hotel association first. So we don't have that category yet. Um, it actually wasn't presented to the board of directors for approval or denial as of yet. We were going to bring it up in discussion this upcoming board meeting uh, because the minimum you have to have um, to pay our rate is if you fall under 100 rooms, you still pay for the 100 rooms. Um, so we don't have that category yet, and it will be going up to the board of directors. Mr. And yes, we would be interested in welcoming them as well. Would you okay. be willing to accept me as a member now? Again, we don't have that category. So in order for us to set a rate, we have to have a board approval, not unless you want to pay for the 100 rooms. I think the answer is clear. Thank you. Right. So we have to create that first. Okay. I guess the, the, the question then, I, and, and I probably I already know the answer, but just to be clear then, because it is kind of like a new topic of discussion for the tourism industry and the hotel industry, um, um, whether there's been any discussion whatsoever in terms of what kind of standards would be, which could be applicable to the smaller bed and breakfasts and guest house, which are different from what the standards. So here's an example. Hotels. Yeah. So here's 
so Senator Jim, um, Senator Espadan, uh, here's an example, like food trucks. Food trucks were a trend a couple years ago. Um, in order to be a member of GHRA, we didn't have a classification for a food truck because you don't necessarily have tables and chairs, right? So tables and chairs, you start out with 125 minimum. And um, there were a couple, like Yardies, Mosas, they all started out fo as food trucks. Their rate was $550 uh, to start. We didn't have a classification for them because they were too small and, and we didn't have a lot of interest from a lot of food trucks. They still joined and they paid that because we didn't have a classification. So if we were to introduce food trucks, for example, we would look at our restaurateur classification and create something for not 125 tables or less, it'll be based on food trucks. So it would be the same thing. Um, so bed and breakfast is the, if the max is, I believe, um, five rooms or less, right, with no more than 90 days, then that would be a new rate, and it would probably be a flat rate, not based on per room. So that's a, just a, an analogy on the food trucks versus restaurateurs, where they don't have seats. I, so I wanna thank you. Um, hold on a second, Mr. Silver. Senator Jimmy, any more comments to that? Um, I do, but I, I'll, I'll reserve okay. them for later thank on. You thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Mr. Sablant, because of the 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 uh, answer that she's given, I'm going to go ahead, and, unless you have a closing comment directed to the chair. Uh, I just want to say that we, we are trying to work with the community and we are trying to be partners with the community. Uh, when I made that effort, I wasn't told I need to pay more. I was told we don't want you as a member. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Madam much. Madam Chair, may I just ask a question, Mr. Sablant? Uh, you can address it to the chair, Ms. To me first, and then we'll go ahead and... I'll Thank you, Madam Chair. But the question is, is simple. Uh, now that in light of all that's going on, has there been discussion upon the bed and breakfast industry or the guest house or a combination of them to actually set another organization to perhaps control and set, you know, again, taking it from a different level from the hotels? Because if we're acknowledging that there's a difference in the type of, of services because of the quantity of the rooms, is there a possibility or has it even been discussed uh, to, uh, to perhaps create a different association just to address this certain market segment? Uh, I will go ahead. Do you want it, Mr. Sablon, to answer yeah, that? Actually, one? anybody at the table. I, I, I'll you know, have Ms. Rhodes, Mr. Sablon, then Ms. Rhodes. Mr. Sablon? I want to say that the first option is to, to always work with the people that are here already, and GHRA has a great reputation. We do want to work with them. Um, but. But in, in light of some of these issues that have been coming up, there has been some discussion amongst uh, our, our fellow bed and breakfast operators to form another association. But we would like to work with GHRA. Ms. Mary? Yeah. I just want to remind everybody, we are a nonprofit, non-government, private organization. We're not a requirement of any industry to join this association um, in order to operate on Guam. We're not like one of your uh, one of the government agencies you have to, have to go through to get a license. So it is a volunteer program. Um, and we, again, want to welcome you. It's just we have to come up with that classification. This is a growing industry. Um, I think there are a lot of benefits to it. Uh, again, we have to set the standards. But we have yet to have the discussion to create a new category. And if anything, this is lighting the fire, right? to the board to create this on Wednesday. We have our chairman, we have our past chairman um, who was here, and you already have the commitment that we're gonna have the discussion to create that category um, with the board. So yes, it will happen. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I ask a question to, to you that may be presented to Mr. O then, and that would be because of the, uh, you can just tell by the audience right now and, and the testimony that was given earlier, there is uh, uh, a group within the, the Korean community who definitely is very active in, in this interest industry and prob probably is interested in even growing it. The, the question, Mr. Rowe, would be that amongst the Korean community themselves, and I'm sure, and again, I know how tight the communi uh, Korean community is in communicating with each other, has, have you and others in the guest house of business <coughs> thought about creating or have you created some kind of an association to really examine the various issues? Mr. O. Um, well, actually, um, the industry right now is really in its infancy. Um, everyone's kind of spread out, um, but at the same time, um, uh, 
present today is actually the president of the Korean Association of Guam and the president of the Korean Women's Association of Guam. Uh, they're here to, they're, they're trying to unite the different operators. Uh, I know that uh, they've tried to uh, gather us together. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. Um, I'm, I'm all against anything illegal, illegal operation. Uh, people that are not paying their 11% tax. I'm definitely against that. Um, and I, I think even within the Korean uh, community, we're definitely against that. Uh, we don't want these illegal operators ruining the image for the rest of the operators. Uh, we just don't think it's fair that these, um, these illegal operators are the reasons why we need to set certain uh, restrictions and policies in place. Well, if I may, Mr. Rowe, the reason why I think we're talking about mm -hmm. uh, the restrictions and policy considerations mm -hmm. is because, as was talked about at this table, mm -hmm. you have the public safety concern, sure, not, sure. Only the, not only the guests, but the mm -hmm. residents within the area. Mm -hmm. You have the public health concerns of, you know, whether they're in good environments or, mm -hmm. you know, what, and things like that. Yes. So I, I, I appreciate the tax issue, but mm -hmm. I think the other uh, – uh, thing that we're going to have to try to figure out legally uh, by law mm -hmm. is how do we address this with these type of operations? Well, I, you know, I'm in complete agreement when it comes to public safety, when it comes to uh, those basic necessities. <coughs> I am totally, you know, in agreement. It's just that um, there are certain types of restrictions that could be put on the industry that could really just kill the industry. As, as Mr. Santos has said earlier, Sublime. this, this, is it Sublime? Sorry, my apologies. Um, but at the same time, because it is, this is an industry in its infancy, uh, too many restrictions or too many guidelines can really kill the industry. Um, I appreciate that answer, Mr. O. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Senator Espaldon. Um, I have two comments for, I mean, two questions for uh, Reverend Tax. But before I do that and we close, I just want to say, um, Ms. Mimi and Mr. Sablon, and also uh, Nate brought up uh, about the Laguanya family, who's been around for over 40 years, or more than four decades. <coughs> we want you, uh, and we appreciate what you're doing, because the intent of that bed and breakfast was to have a single dwelling for tourists to come to us and experience Guam, the Guam experience, the warm hospitality, who we are as island people. And, and that's what we want. We don't want to take that away from you. Please know that. And with the example set this morning, two questions comes to mind for Reventex, and I know they might not have the answer right now, is does DRT have the authority to enter into agreements with states like um, Airbnb to uh, have the uh, them collect and remit taxes on our behalf is one, okay, for Airbnb. And number two, are there any existing Guam rules and regulations which can which we can review for B and Bs or vacation rentals? If there's if if the answer uh, is yes or no to each of that, I'd like to at least see what uh, uh, is in Guam right now. I, I guess if there's anything existing right now. I don't think there's, for the first question, whether we can collect taxes uh, with other jurisdictions. You would need legislation then, right? Yeah, I think you need legislation for that one. Um, and this, the second one, I'm not too sure what, what your second question is. Uh, are there any existing Guam rules and regulations already with Revan Tax, which we can review for bed and breakfast or vacation rentals? No. Don't you don't have any of that right now? We don't have any regulations okay. or guidelines. Or so I, then we have to do a further follow-up yes. based on licenses that have been presently given today. And again, <coughs> not to take away from any of the bed and breakfast that has existed, even those before Public Law 3245 was, was passed into law, that there have been successful bed and breakfast concepts that has been here for more than three decades if not four decades, that have been successful, and we want to keep those. So, so um, I, I, I want to close um, by saying that uh, we want to first thank everyone for being here, 
and and uh, for your presence today because this is definitely a, a, a great start to continue uh, policy writing that we're going to need to uh, define to to um, make sure that the definitions are in place and a complete definition for all that is intact. We want to uh, literally draw clear distinctions between short-term term vacation uh, rentals and B&Bs. We want to consider revisions uh, to existing laws that would require business uh, entries to appoint a registered agent for uh, court servicing and tax collection purposes, protect and foster B&Bs doing it right, and provide a mechanism that identifies B&Bs through appropriate signage and registrations. Increase penalties to, acts, uh, to act as a deterrent and uh, to consider liability insurance for vacation rentals and B&Bs of certain size or income. Those are just the start of what has come to this table today and as committed to you earlier, I said um, when these drafts come out, uh, an opportunity will come. The same uh, roundtable-like discussion will be presented. I will invite all of this, all of you that are here today, and those who are listening to us, if they'd like to come. But we will definitely move forward. And I want to thank my vice chair also for being here, because one who's had the experience to going to all the other countries, he too can give us a better distinction of what we literally need to put in. Uh, for for clear distinction. So, Undunkalina uh, Sitsus Masi, to all of you here, thank you very much for your time. I know it's been long. We started this at 9, and if there's no other questions from the audience sitting down outside, I'm going to go ahead and call this roundtable. I do like to acknowledge the presence of Tamuning Mayor, uh, Mayor Rivera. Thank you for being here since 9 o'clock. Uh, we'll call this roundtable uh, adjourned. Sign a and God bless each and every one of you. Bye-bye.